Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second session. Um, I hope you had a, had a chance to try out some of the activities we did last week. Please add them to the chat box if you did, um, and just talk about any successes, any things that didn't work quite as well as you maybe hoped they would. But like last session, try and keep talking in the chat box so we can answer your questions. But as I say, share any successes, any things that you tried uh, since our last session. So what we're going to look at today is what does being physically literate mean? And what can you as parents do to ensure that your children become physically literate? I'm just going to put a little presentation on. Oh, can, uh, can someone um, enable my screen sharing, please? Okay, so we're looking at um, what becoming physically literate actually means. So first of all, let's just have a look at the definition of what physically literate means. So we, we all know we're talking about the same thing. So some of it is about having the physical competence, but a, a lot of it is wrapped up in motivation and confidence as well. One of the big, um, there's an organization in England called NICE, which looks at physical activity guidelines and barriers to participation. And one of the things they said was it's a perceived um, competence or incompetence and that children and then moving on into adults decide they can't do some sort of physical activity. And because they think they can't do it, they stop doing it. And what we talked about last session is that a lot of this um, about movement, it doesn't happen naturally. We don't suddenly learn to be able to do a certain physical activity. We take practice. We do it over and over again. If you think of when your children were learning to walk, how many times they got up, and fell over and got up and tried again and again and again. They got a lot of practice. We'll be doing some walking um, in our session soon. Um, and it'll be funny because I'll be asking you to think about how you walk. And you probably haven't thought about how you walk since you were actually a toddler learning to walk. So we're going to be looking at, as I said, what physical activity is, physical literacy is, and how you can actually help your children. Um, I have a video to show you. So, and I think this little girl explains what physically, physical literacy is much better than I can. So if you can listen to this video and then any comments, anything in the chat that you want to say, please feel free. Can you show the video, please? Any video coming? I think I may have it embedded in my presentation if it's a problem. Yeah, I just play mine. Okay. You have until I'm seven years old to make sure I can do this, this, and this. Obviously, I can already do this stuff because I get lots of help. Lots of kids don't and are really missing out. Physical literacy. And we need you to help us as early as possible. So we can do all kinds of things when we're older. We'll try anything at this age. So now's the time to help us. Before it's too late. Because if we don't learn these basic skills now, we might just give up. We might never discover what we could have been good at, and we might turn into couch potatoes. So fire us up. Inspire us. If you don't, you're asking us to settle for a life that's shorter and less healthy. And we don't want that, do we? I think one of the 
key things for you as parents in there is lots of opportunities. The more opportunities you can give your children to be physically active and try a, a range of activities, um, the more likely they are to develop a good movement vocabulary um, and become physically literate. So it's about giving them a lot of different um, opportunities. Sometimes it can be very tempting. Um, the children want to play football or they want to play tennis and they like those activities, but actually giving them that wide range will make them better sports people um, as they get older and actually open up more opportunities for them. If we have, there are some early specialization sports, things like gymnastics and swimming, where actually children end up spending a lot of time training for those activities and then maybe aren't as physically literate as they might be later on. Um, from a personal experience, my daughter was a fantastic gymnast, but that meant training over 20 hours a week. She did a lot of gymnastics. So from the purpose of a body control from a physical literacy point of view, she was really good at getting her body to do strange things, tumbles, flips on beams, all of those kind of things. But if you gave her a tennis racket later on, she's not that good at it because she didn't do a lot of object control activities, which we'll be talking about um, at our next session, we're going to be looking at object control. So being physically literate is very important. The other thing to be thinking of um, is that um, the, the first part of that session, the, um, the first thing the little girl says is, you have until I am seven. And that's the, one of the really key things for us that actually children develop that physical literacy um, before they're seven. So the opportunities we can give them, the more opportunities we can give them before they're seven, the better it is. Now we're not saying that they can't become physically literate um, later on, but the opportunities, the best opportunities are when children are developing. So this program is a fantastic opportunity for you as parents to make sure that you're giving your children the best start that you possibly can from a physically literate point of view. Remember, I'm looking at the chat box. Anything you want to add in, any comments, um, please feel free. So what I'd like you to think about is um, if, we, if children aren't physically literate, what happens? So if we look at um, this activity, there's a list um, of lots of different activities that we can play as adults, um, young people can play. So what if I said to you, um, what happens if you can't catch? Have a look at those activities and just think about which of those activities would children not be able to take part in if they couldn't catch. So, if we suddenly take out being able to catch, we take out the opportunity to take part in a lot of activities. I would also suggest this, this research came from Edinburgh University. Um, but one of the things I would say is actually, if you can't get your hands in the right place at the right time to catch something, it's very unlikely <coughs> that you'll be able to get your tennis racket or badminton racket or squash racket in the right place to be able to play those sports as well. So consequently, <coughs> excuse me, from a lack of physical literacy, a lack of being able to catch a ball actually narrows hugely the opportunities that children have. So something to be thinking about. Um, if I share a story, um, a friend of mine 
this is a few years ago now, her son had a birthday party for his sixth birthday. And the children were playing, it was a beautiful day and she took them outside and the children were playing football and having a fantastic time. But she has a bit of a background like me with physical education, physical literacy. And she thought, oh, I give them a game. They can maybe play rounders, let's have a different game. So she said, oh, we're going to play rounders. And she got the equipment out. And one little boy said, I'm not playing that. It's a rubbish game. And she said to him, well, you don't have to play if you don't want to play. So the children were playing and this little boy sat at the side. But she said that the children were having a fantastic time and she was watching him. And she had said, he sat there with a really sad face. So in the end, she'd gone over to him and said, you know, are you sure you don't want to join in? And at this time he started getting quite aggressive. I don't want to play. I told you this is a rubbish game. But actually what that little boy was doing was covering up because he really did want to play. And after she sat next to him and talked to him for a while, um, he said, I can't catch. So at seven year old, he had opted out of an activity because he couldn't catch. Now, my challenge to you as parents is, let's not let that happen to your children. Let's make sure that we give them all of the opportunities. Now, I'm not talking about making them Olympic champions. I'm talking about making them confident adults who will be able to pick up the ball and maybe play in the garden with their own children. So something to be thinking about, big opportunities, lots of different activities. And we'll look at what those opportunities can be as we go on today. So what I'm just going to look at is if we're talking about physical literacy, this is at the bottom, the fundamental movement skills. So what we're doing is actually helping you help your children to build a good, strong base, a foundation to build the other skills on. So we want children to develop their balance, their object control. Now we say object control, because we may, yes, we do mean a tennis racket. We do mean it being able to kick a ball, but this is bigger than that. We mean children who are able um, to carry a tray in school with a drink on and not spill it. Children who can pick up a knife and fork and eat their food properly. Children who can write well. And we talked about this last week, how you need um, those fundamental movement skills and the fine motor skills that come from the gross motor skills to be able to do their handwriting. From that, once we've got those activities, we can move into throwing and rolling and kicking and jumping. So we are very much looking at the base of the pyramid, the first two steps in there to actually help our children develop that physical literacy. We also need them to develop strength. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here because we talked about this last week about how important it is to have the physical strength, the core stability to be able to sit up at a desk and do your writing, <coughs> excuse me. And also um, having that strong foundation to be able to move. Also, if they're stronger, they're less likely to hurt themselves. Um, sometimes you might have children who decide they're going to go climbing in the parks and up the climbing frame, which is a fantastic um, activity for children. But sometimes they might actually try and do an activity that they don't have the strength to do. So actually making sure all of the activities we did last week that I hope you've been practicing, um, they help children develop that strength and enable them to, do, to become physically literate. So let's look at what a movement vocabulary means for physical literacy. So if we're looking at, we have three areas. We're going to look at locomotion. That means how they get from one place to another. We're looking at stability. So that's that balance. Now we're not talking about balance as in just being able to stand or sit still. We're also, that's called static balance. We're also looking at dynamic balance, the ability to be able to move um, without falling over. And we're also looking at object control. 
Today in our session, we are going to be focusing on locomotion and stability. And in our next session, we'll be doing some more about um, object control. So these are some of the activities we would have in locomotion, giving children the opportunity to do all of those different things. Um, so crawling around, rolling, stepping, jogging, running, jumping, climbing. As I said earlier on, those little parks that you might have in your apartments downstairs. Um, some of those are fantastic opportunities, like a little gym for children to be building up their strength, building up their sense of adventure. And, um, you know, sometimes we, we protect children too much. Um, I, uh, my grandsons live in Dubai and they have a nanny. And sometimes when I go to visit, and unfortunately I can't at the moment, but when I go and visit, I go down to the park um, with my grandchildren. And the oldest one is six and he will climb everywhere. And sometimes I watch his nanny saying, Christian, be careful, don't go there, don't do that, don't do that. And he looks at me and I'm saying, go on, go on. Because what we want children to do is actually develop. Sometimes children, when they're doing activities, they're, they're doing something that's a little bit scary. And when they finished it, they have that, yes, I did that moment. And we want children to actually learn to take risks, but we want them to take healthy risks so that they can decide whether or not they can do things. Have you ever had that experience when you take a child to a big park and they go running towards it because they're so excited and then when they get near to it they stop and they go mm? because what they're doing is deciding what how risky things are and what they are prepared to do. So lots of different uh, ways of moving in there. You'll see swimming is in there too. Um, someone asked me about swimming last week um, and in the handouts, I've actually included some locomotion activities that you can do in the pool with your children. Stability. This is about being able to stand up, lie down, sit down, stop, you know, jumping and be able to stop, run and be able to stop. It's also about twisting round and not falling over, bending down to pick something up from the floor. All of those things involve stability. Next one, object control. That's about being able to reach something, grasp something, carry something, put something down where you want it to go, pass things from one hand to the other hand. It's about being able to send, so throw a ball, um, hit a ball with a bat. It's about being able to catch, bounce, all of those different things that you use with lots of different objects. So what we're looking at is, can we give children the opportunities to develop those things? And that's what we're going to um, have a look at here. So it's about getting a movement vocabulary. It's about children knowing what their body can do. Um, and then we're going to look at where it can do it, how it can do it, and with what or whom the body can do it. So by that, I mean, can you run behind somebody? Can you run beside someone? Can you run while bouncing a ball? Um, can you go along a line? So all of those different things. And I'm going to show you what I mean by these. Um, just now. So hopefully, just, I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything before we move on to our practical activities. I'm going to give you two minutes, or maybe one minute, because I've got a lot to fit in this morning. Um, any questions, any comments on what you've heard so far? Okay, if we don't have any questions, I'm going to move on to some of our physical activity. So I'm hoping that some of you have got your trainers on and you're going to join in with me. First of all, we're going to look at some locomotion activities. As I said, you have handout, handouts with, these information, with this information that goes with the course. Um, 
and I'm going to do some different ones just so it gives you a big repertoire um, to help you help your children develop that movement vocabulary. So we're going to start off with walking. And like I said, it's probably a long time since any of you thought about how you actually walk. So let's get up and start some walking. So what I'd like us to think about first of all is just have a little bit of a walk. And I'd like you to think about what you do when you walk. Which part of your foot hits the ground first? What do your arms do? So if we're thinking about it with children, in general, when we're walking, our heel hits first, we roll through the foot and the other heel goes down. We keep our heads up nice and straight and we use our arms and legs in what we call opposition. So if my right foot goes forward, my left arm goes forward. Sometimes with children, that's a little bit strange at first. So what we actually do is we play with walking and we ask them to do walking in lots and lots of different ways. So if I say to you, okay then, who can walk forwards? So we can walk forwards. Who can walk backwards? Who can walk sideways? Or it's a can you walk forwards? Can you walk sideways? The reason we say can you is because if they can't, it doesn't matter. If we say walk like this and they can't do it, children are thinking, oh, I can't do that. But if you say, can you, it means let's have a try. Doesn't matter if you can't. So what we're gonna do is experiment with walking in lots of different ways. So can you walk tall? So we might have the children walking up really tall. Can you walk small? Can you walk at a medium height? So they're changing where they walk. Can you walk on your toes? On your heels? Asking children to walk on their heels can be quite interesting because some children have some retrained primitive reflexes that they had when they were babies and if they haven't got rid of them normally you develop things like when a child holds a pencil at for, or grips a baby, grips your finger like that so they have that grip, grip and then you want them to develop a pencil grip. So they have to inhibit this one to develop that one. Now, some of, some of the uh, primitive reflexes that children may maintain means that when they go to walk on the heels, sometimes some of them bend over really like this. But it's just about practicing, letting them experiment with the way they walk. Then we might say, can you walk with small steps? Can you walk with big steps? Can you walk um, like you're in a strong wind walking a dog? So how would you walk in a strong wind and blowing up against you? Can you work, walk in a straight line? Can you walk in a spiral? So all we're doing here is asking children to experiment with the way they walk. And I'm just going to show you why we do that. So what we're looking at is when we take an activity. So we talked earlier on about what the body can do. So if we looked at this example, the body can run. But then we look at three different things, where you can do it, how you do it, and with what or who. So things like, in the, just the activities that I've done there, we've looked at moving forwards, moving backwards, we've looked at walking tall, we've looked at walking small. Effort, we haven't done, we're going to do a little bit more about effort, about changing 
the way we walk, the force we put through it, we could do slowly, quickly, and we haven't done the relationships bit. But all we're doing is taking one type of movement and we're changing it in lots of different ways. So this is where you can experiment and have really good fun with your children. Things like who can walk in a funny way? Who's got the funniest way of walking? So we can look at all of those. So we might say, if we're looking at force, who can walk, who can move quietly like a pixie? Who can stomp like an elephant? Who can, we've done small steps, big steps. Let's say who can walk with their cuddly toy. So we're doing it with something. Who can walk with their cuddly toy? Who can pass their cuddly toy around their body while they're walking? Who can walk tall with their cuddly toy, small with their cuddly toy? Who can walk behind a friend? I don't have a friend here with me, so let's pretend my cuddly toy is a friend. Can you walk behind a friend? Can you walk beside a friend, backwards with a friend? So all we're doing is changing that activity doing lots of different things. Anyone got any questions? Please stop me if you have as we're going through those. What we can also do, which children really like, is have a look at using some music to change the way children move. So I'm going to put some music on now. Um, if you are joining in with me, I hope you enjoy it, but let's just look at different ways that different pieces of music can actually influence the way children move. Battery 50%. Connected to Leslie Hinderby's iPod and Leslie's MacBook. I just have to do this through my computer, just a second. Children really like that one because they think it's scary. They get down low and stomp 
and move. How about this one? Very floaty this one, light on their feet. Hopefully you get the idea um, of just changing that music means that it's, um, it changes the way children um, move. You can just download the playlist, ask the children some of the music that you, you, they like, just get them to dance around. But you can get them to walk fast, slow, doing lots of different things. Um, <clears throat> another one we can do is actually get them, if you've got any brothers and sisters at home, they can stand in a line, walk in a line together, keep, keeping the same distance as they're moving. So they're moving along and then they change the leader, but the person at the front can change to make it walking fast, walking slow, walking tall, walking small. So they get the chance to be at the front and the change, and the person at the front is the pace setter. And if you're outside, you should have some beautiful weather at the moment. Um, children can do that in a, in a large area. And actually, if they're practicing it over quite a large area in the space, they're getting a bit puffed out too. So they're actually learning about some stamina and being able to sustain running. We can then do a little bit of what they call mood walking. And all the time, what we're doing is practicing different ways of walking. So mood walking can be, can you walk as if you were walking in thick mud? So they've got their feet stuck. Can you walk in your area of the world? Can you walk as if you were on really hot sand? Can you walk as if you were moving along a narrow ledge? Can you walk as if you were happy? Can you walk as if you're sad? So you're asking children just to chop and change and do things in different ways. Let's have a look at the marching on the spot activity. Um, let's see. Let's have a try. We're just going to start with counting to six. So we might march and we go one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going right, left, right, left, right, left. Then we could march on the spot. So we're on the spot. Then we can go forward. And backwards. To the side. Then we might ask the children to clap, so clap underneath. And we could, once we've had a bit of practice with that, we could actually put some music to it. So if I add some of the music from before, let me see, this one has got marching, a marching music. Can make a pattern on the floor, 
they can do lots of different um, ways of moving with that. Okay, let's have a look at a bit of jumping. Jumping is quite a nice one because the children can jump in lots of different ways. There are five different ways of jumping for children. They can jump from two feet to two feet. They can jump or leap from one foot to the other foot. They can go from one foot to the same foot, usually known as a hop. Then we can go from two feet to one foot and we can go from one foot to two feet. So children can experiment with lots of different ways of jumping. Um, they can jump, you can jump at the balloon. You can join all those different ways of jumping together. So lots of different things to do for locomotion. Let's have a look at stability. We did a few stability exercises last week. So if I say, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to sit on the floor, I'm going to lift my feet off the floor, which is actually quite hard. Can I pass my teddy bear around me? Can I put one foot down? Can I put the other foot down? Can I put one hand down? So they're experimenting with balancing, with being stable on their bottom and actually moving along. Um, climbing, we've talked about this. Climbing in the playground is a fantastic one to be doing with children. Actually, get letting them get out there, and as I say, try not to be the parent who's saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. Because every time you get a child who might be rushing up that neck or whatever, really confident, really happy, as soon as they start hearing a parent going, be careful, be careful, they start, the doubt start to come in. Now, I'm, you know your children, obviously better than I do, but in general, children, children will only take that risk until they start thinking themselves, mm, I'm not sure about this. So let them find their level, let them find where they start thinking, I'm not sure. And it might be that you help them, or it might be that you encourage them to come down and say, that was fantastic. You did brilliantly, maybe next time we'll try and go one more step up. But praise them for what they've done. Um, activities, things like one leg balance, asking them to stand on one leg, um, start off with 10 seconds. Can you stand on one leg for 10 seconds? For some small children, this is actually quite hard. Can you stand on this leg for 10 seconds? You can build up the time um, to 30 seconds once they start getting good at it. You can ask them to close their eyes and see if they can balance. Have a try at home. In the balance, you, you lift your leg up, then close your eyes. All of a sudden, it's much harder to balance because you haven't got something to focus on. So it sometimes helps your children if you say to them, um, can you um, close, look at something carefully? And that might help you balance. Okay. Another one, now I have some little cones here. Don't have to be fancy cones like this, they can be a, a paper plate. And what I'm going to do is put them around my feet. Now I might have to arrange the computer screen so you can see it a little better. So there's the four cones. And what you can do with the children, this is quite hard, is you can ask them to stand on one leg and you pick a colour. So you might say orange, and they go down and they touch the orange one and they have to come back up. It's much easier if they stay down here. They have to come back up again. I say blue, down to touch the blue, back up. Pink, down to touch the pink and back up. The yellow one, the one at the back, is pretty hard. Let them practice. Make sure when you're doing these, um, Fundamental skills that you do them on both legs. Use both hands so the children have the chance to practice. If you might say to them, touch it with your right hand. So for example, if I, if you ask me to touch blue with my right hand, it means I've got to go over my body to touch it. 
Now, if you remember, last week, we talked about crossing the midline, and actually crossing the midline makes that more difficult. So if they start going that way, across the body, it's harder. So, you know, let them have a go at that one. Another one that's quite a good one is... Uh, Another one that is a good one is the slow race. So when I do this with the children, I actually start saying to them, we're going to have a race. And they get really excited and they line them up. And then I say, on your mark, set. And just as they're about to race away, I say, hold on, hang on a minute. Um, the person who wins this race is the person who's the last to the line. But you've got to keep running. So I do things like this, <clears throat> bit of um, slow motion running. So they run, and then they go down, and they run. But actually what they're doing is developing their dynamic balance because they're having to balance on one leg to do that. But the children don't actually realize that that's what they're doing. So being able to do that makes a big difference. Another stability exercise, <coughs> I'm just going to use my mat for this one, a log roll. So what we do with children here is we ask them to make a long, thin shape. So their legs are together. Their arms are up above their head. And what they need to do here is squeeze their tummies together, squeeze their legs together, and they roll from their back to their tummy in one go. That's called the log roll, and then they can do it back again. What we don't want to see is children lifting one leg and tipping over, because that's not a log roll. What we want them to do is <coughs> keep their body really tight, move and roll over. So we've done lots of different um, locomotion and um, stability activities there. So have a think, is there anything that you already do that fits into these? Anything in the chat yet? Right, let's have a look um, just to um, summarize. One of the big things that you can do as a parent is create that right environment for children. They need a positive atmosphere. And what I said is praise them. All they want to do, especially the young ones, is to hear you say well done. They love being praised, reinforced, you know, you can do this. So rather than saying, oh, no, you can't do that, say, well, that was brilliant. You were doing your climbing and were really getting your hands up there and you were balancing on your feet and you did brilliantly. Maybe they didn't go as high as they would have liked to go. One of the hardest things as a parent is to stop comparing your child to other children. And it's about looking at what they can do and making sure that they are happy and confident with what they're doing. Not you looking and thinking, oh, well, his friend James can go so much higher than he can. Just look at your child and encourage them. Like I said last week, there is a clear developmental process as in children will go through. They will develop in the same order, but they will develop at different rates. And they will also develop depending on how much practice they get. So the more they're out there, the more the better it is for them developing. They do need access to equipment. Um, and I think one of the, the good things, especially when it comes to object control that we'll be looking at next week, is 
Make sure you have lots of different objects. So big balls, small balls, balloons, feathers, lots of different things. And it doesn't have to be expensive equipment. Balloons are fantastic and not expensive. If you have some balloons or some bubbles that you might want to have on hand for our object control session next week, also, the inside of the kitchen roll, the tube from inside the kitchen roll is great for keeping up balloons and it teaches children about using an object to propel another object. So lots of time for practice, lots of different equipment that you, know, that you can find. Just try and get them to do lots of different things. Big beach balls, nothing expensive. Um, you can make um, skittles out of water bottles, put a little bit of water at the bottom, a little bit of sand at the bottom, and they have a target, something to roll at. Um, try to avoid elimination games. If I go back to my grandson in Dubai again, I once went back to school and watched him do a karate lesson. And it was interesting because there were children in that class from about four to eight. Now, the eight-year-olds were way more mature, more capable physically than the younger ones. And the coach at the end decided to play this game where they lined up in the middle and he would shout, I think it was robbers and raiders, and if he shouted, robbers one, went one way, raiders they went the other way. And whoever was last getting to the side was out. So what happened in general was it was the younger children that were out, but it was also the children who needed the most practice who were out. So what you do with games where children are out is that the children who need the most practice end up, end up watching the children who are already good at it get better. So think of ways of, can there, is there a chance, can they have three turns? Ways that children get to carry on playing without being out. Um, looking at ways to include all children. Um, Quite often with, um, I had a, a friend who, or a colleague that I worked with, who was, um, he was visually impaired. And he said his biggest barrier to participation was his parents not letting him out to do things because they were frightened he might hurt himself. So he said his friends used to come um, to call for him and he used to tell his parents that they were going to someone else's house to play. And he said what we were actually doing was going to the park to play football because one of my friends had got a ball that had a bell in it so I could play as well. He said, but I didn't tell my parents because they wouldn't have let me go. Um, so again, it's about challenging and supporting your children, encouraging them. If they get tired, they don't need to do it. It's not about too much practice. It's about getting that, that fine balance where it's fun, it's supportive and it's safe for children. Um, another idea that you can use is there are some fantastic storybooks that lend themselves to um, physical activity and physical literacy. One of my favourites isn't actually on here and it's called Giraffes Can't Dance and it talks about Gerald who's a tall giraffe so you can make the children make tall shapes. He was very good at standing still so they can do some balances and also munching trees off, shoots off leaves, off trees. So you can I, I sometimes balance a beanbag and ask them to stand on one leg and reach the beanbag. So lots of different activities. So think about when you're using some of the stories you might read with your children, could you make it an active story? Could you make it something um, that the children would like to join in? Okay. I'm going to stop that share there. And what I'd like any questions or any comments, please. Um, anything that you've tried from last week, anything you'd like to, to share with the rest of us, please don't be shy. I'm going to give a couple of a couple of minutes this time for a question. I seem to remember that this group was the chatty group last week. You had lots of questions and things on chat last week. Oh, 
Okay. Another thing then to think about from a parental point of view is that yes, we want our children to develop physical literacy. But what we also want them to develop is confidence, social skills, um, that healthy risk taking. And sometimes some of that can come from um, actually being given some unstructured play opportunities. And I think that more and more in the world, we have this idea of the world being a more dangerous place for children. Lots of cars, um, a bit of stranger danger. And so we're much more protective um, of our children. I think I might have mentioned last week that there was a neuroscientist in America who called this generation of children the bubble wrap generation. So it's about looking at, can we give them opportunities for free, unstructured play? Because sometimes when we start thinking about physical literacy, we start thinking, oh, well, I send them to swimming lessons. I send them to tennis lessons, I send them to golf or athletics. And what you're doing there is a fantastic job in giving them a wide range of different physical skills. But what we aren't doing is giving them some unstructured time, some time where they can just go and play and make the, up their own game. They make up their own games, they make up their own rules. And I remember when I was a child, which is a long time ago, we didn't worry about physical literacy levels because we called it playing out. I was out playing from early in the morning till late at night. We didn't have adult supervision. I think it was a community that idea that everyone knew the children were out playing and they would be keeping an eye out. And there was always someone's mom who was around looking. We always knew where we could go if we needed help. But we didn't have adults deciding what we did or intervening if we had a problem. If we were um, unhappy with something that was happening in our game, we sorted it out. We had to chat. We had to cooperate and compromise with other children. And in an article, a piece of research I read recently, they talked about this being the stepping stone to democracy because children have to organize and find out and compromise and do those things. Um, and if they're always having structured activities, we take away that opportunity. I know here in the UK, the opportunities for unstructured play are much more limited now than they were before because parents are really nervous about leaving children out to play. But as I said, when I was in Dubai recently, I was pleasantly surprised in that the children went downstairs and underneath the apartment complex there was a big park at one end and there was a pool at the other end and these children actually, there were nannies with them but the nannies tended to be in a group and talk together or look after the baby so some of the other children ran around the bottom of the apartment and they were playing all sorts of imaginary games, climbing on the frames jumping, they weren't going in the pool, but they were hard playing hide and seek, and they were coming with, up with all sorts of games that they'd invented the rules for. They weren't going back to the nannies to say, this person is being mean to me, or, so I think that sometimes if you live in a community where you know the children can't get out, um, that they're safe, that you maybe do have the opportunities to let them play. Um, and I know there was a, a group of parents in America who set up an activity a day or a morning where they would take the children to the park, and it was a big park, and the parents would say, right, this is where we are going to sit. This is where we are if you need any help. And the children were allowed for an hour, a couple of hours, to go around and explore in the park and play. Something to think about if we want to get children back into those risk takers, their social conscience, and as I say, being our political leaders of the future by actually having to negotiate and develop those negotiating skills from being younger. But again, that is something as parents, you know your children, um, and you will know what's best for them. So, do I have any questions in the chat? Yes. So 
hopefully you will um, go and try some of the different activities. As I said last week, it's not about getting it right or wrong. It's actually about taking the time to play with your child. Put your phone away and just concentrate on that child. They are the ones that most precious thing in that moment. And you play with them, do lots of different activities, encourage them to do different activities. And we're on the road to help them being physically literate. So in our next session, we're going to be looking at how to develop object control skills. We're also going to be looking at a movement assessment tool. So if you are worried about your children and thinking that there are some areas of physical literacy in which they're lacking, we'll actually be able to use this tool to help you identify, well, actually, they need a little bit more help with object control or a little bit more help with locomotion. So you can actually um, use this. I'll show you how to use the tool, and then you can have a go at home. Um, and see um, how this works. So thank you very much, everyone. Still, any questions? Um, I'm here for another couple of minutes. And like I said, right next week, if you want to have some bubbles or balloons um, or the inside of the kitchen wall handy um, for us to have a go at, or any other pieces of equipment that you play with at home with each other, and, um, you know, when, when children get presents and then they spend, especially younger ones, often spend more time playing in the boxes and, then and um, thinking about, you know, what objects can you get children to play with in the house that aren't expensive and are easily accessible. Um, so, any questions? Or comments doesn't have to be a um, doesn't have to be a question. Anything that you would still like us to do? We have two more sessions together. So anything you're thinking, well, Leslie, I would really like to um, do some of this, or could you show us how to do that? Please ask, and then um, we'll see how we can do it in the next session. Everyone being shy this week. Well, I hope our questions before the session were around um, your knowledge and understanding of physical literacy. So hopefully you know what's meant by physical literacy and you can now go with, with some tools and some activities to actually play with your children and help them just become happy and confident and physical literate, physically literate adults who can then pass this on to their children. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And I'll see you next session.